My NBC News colleagues are at polling places in battleground states as voters are casting their ballot. We've got Dasha Burns in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Ali Vitale is in Tampa. Jesse Kirsch is in Youngstown, Ohio, and Blaine Alexander is in Atlanta. So let's check it all out. Dasha, let me start with you. Allegheny was a county that took forever to report. Are we going to get Allegheny tonight? Well, we're hearing that Allegheny is not going to be the problem this time around. There is much more concern around Philadelphia. And Chuck, you're not going to believe it. We are following a developing story in Luzerne County, one of our county to county locations, a place where we've been tracking voters for over a year now. We are hearing from local officials there that dozens of polling places ran out of paper today, ran out of paper to print those ballots, and voters were turned away, told to come back later. Within just the last couple of hours, the court there extended the uh, polling close times to 10 p.m. So voters now have, instead of till 8 o'clock, they have until 10 o'clock. They're hoping that some of those folks that were turned away earlier are going to come back. They had mm. to run to nearby towns to try to get more of that paper. It's, of course, not something you can just go buy at Staples. It's a, you know, kind of a, a special type of paper. <laughs> that these ballots are printed on. And there is a lot of concern about what this is going to mean. This is a critical county. It's one of the reasons we spent so much time there. Yeah. And folks are saying that this is potentially disenfranchisement for folks. And I, I, I wonder uh, what we're going to start hearing out of the campaigns about this. That's just a lack of preparation. Look, I, I, I happen to know this. Uh, the, the, the issue, look, paper's been a supply chain issue. Um, the paper that's used to also print yeah. direct mail that people get in their mailboxes, you know, uh, this fact that the state didn't proactively see this, this this is something that may be on the state or on the county here. We'll want to dig in more into this. But the idea that they ran out of paper, that that that's a as we like to say, that's a their that's a them problem, perhaps. Right, Dasha? <laughs> Yeah, definitely an unforced, definitely an unforced error there. I, the reaction I'm hearing from local officials is just kind of shock. How how is that something that can happen on election day? They did have some provisional ballots, but of course there are fewer of those provisionals mm. than there are the regular ballots, so they ran out of those in a lot of places as well. So it's just turning out to be a, a, a big mess. And meanwhile, over in Philadelphia, we're hearing that that process is now going to take longer because of a GOP lawsuit right. kind of backing commissioners there into a corner, making them. Uh, put in back into place a process that looks at voters who might potentially have double voted called poll book right. reconciliation that just really slows things down. So uh, we're going to be waiting a while here, Chuck. Well, I was just going to say that's the one call we can make, which is don't try to get Pennsylvania Senate results before midnight tonight. Anyway, Dasha <laughs> Burns in Pennsylvania for his Dasha. Thank you. Let's go down to Ali Vitale. She is in Tampa, Florida. And Ali, the thing that keeps in the back of my mind here, particularly in the state of Florida, the early vote looks like Democrats are not showing up. Polling indicates yeah. Democrats are fired up. The actuality in Florida doesn't seem to be matching what the polls say. What are you seeing on the ground? Yeah, it may be a question of just a lack of infrastructure here because, Chuck, even just in the last two hours, I've started getting some spin even before the polls have closed from Democrats in the state here. And what they're highlighting is the fact that they think they were doing their jobs, but that national Democrats seemingly abandoned mm. the state of Florida. And what they're pointing to is things like the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee putting 10 times the amount of money in in 2018 during the last Senate contest here as they did right now for for Val Demings, who's challenging Senator Marco Rubio. The same goes on the gubernatorial front, the Democratic Governors Association investing 10 times less this cycle than they did last cycle. And so that's what Florida Democrats are starting to point to, the fact mm. that both Republican incumbents here have been consistently polling ahead. But frankly, what I've heard from both Democrats and Republicans alike here is that in Florida, the Democratic infrastructure has really faltered. And so yep. that's one explanation for why you're seeing high enthusiasm, but not not exactly seeing it come out in the polls because frankly dosh is going to have a late night but really we could have a very early one here in a lot of these key races yeah no and, and florida is going to be probably counting their finishing their count and preparing for a hurricane uh yeah. perhaps before midnight right. ali vitale uh in what looks like a very quiet tampa behind you there ali thank you all right yeah. let's go to another former battleground state <laughs> and i say former we'll find out tonight we're going to go to youngstown ohio that's where we find jesse kirsch look Youngstown, this is sort of uh, the heart of the working class vote, if you will, where Democrats used to own this vote. Tim Ryan 
if he, you know, this is this is his neck of the woods. Uh, if he somehow overperforms here, he might pull the upset. What are you seeing, Jesse? Yeah, and Chuck, for context, right, we're at the heart, you said, of working class. We're at the heart of Tim Ryan's congressional district. So, right, we're looking at all these campaign signs here. This is the hometown Senate candidate. He's up against Republican J.D. Vance. And one of the things that has been a question going back to the primary here is what is former President Donald Trump's influence on this race going to be? And we saw it again last night, the former president stumping one last time on election eve with Vance in the Dayton area. But at the same time, Tim Ryan brags about agreeing with the former president on some issues. And we asked voters here, again, this is Ryan's district, so a Democratic-leaning area. We asked them what they thought. One person told us that he thinks it hurts Vance more than it helps him because he views Trump as a, quote, wild card. Uh, another voter said that he doesn't think it makes a difference for him. Both of those people said they were voting for Tim Ryan. Again, he is the hometown candidate here in Youngstown. And here's something that I think you'll get a chuckle out of. Um, we, we asked people what resonates about Tim Ryan, what they think of when they think of him. And one person told us at the same time that he knows from his parents that they see him as pro-union, so workers. That's obviously something that Ryan mm -hmm. has touted in his campaign. But at the same time, he sees Ryan as someone who flip-flops, and that is something that Vance right. has argued about Ryan. But of course, at the same time, you could argue Vance has flip-flopped on things, including his praise now for former President Donald Trump, someone he used to take swipes at himself, uh, what feels like many moons ago. It is. It got quite personal here. The, the line I'm looking, the number I'm looking at is five. Does Ryan, is the Ryan Vance race less than five points or not? We shall see tonight. All right, let's close things out in the state that may take the longest to decide, at least in the Senate race, if it ends up in a runoff, and that is the state of Georgia. That's where we find Blaine Alexander. And Blaine, I want to start with talking about Stacey Abrams uh, and her machine, if you will. Her turnout machine overperformed in 2018. Took a race that a lot of people didn't think she was going to get close in, and she got really close. Clearly, it was the it was open the door for Democrats to do well in 2020. What's the uh, status of the Abrams machine in 2022? Well, it's making its closing arguments. You know, Chuck, I think what's interesting is the way that she's spending her final hours of this gubernatorial campaign. She's going around to small places and really kind of popping up and surprising people. You know, it's a stark difference from what we've seen from Republican Governor uh, Brian Kemp. He held a very large rally last night, had people come out, kind of your typical uh, closing argument political fair. What she did is she actually just went to the campus of Georgia State and literally just popped up, uh, started talking to students, taking some pictures, has done the same thing with a number of stores nearby. She did something similar at a Target recently, for example, and a couple of other small stores. I asked her about her approach in the final hours, and she told me that she really is going to places where she feels the voters are underrepresented. One thing that Stacey Abrams has said all along, and she's repeated in these final hours, Chuck, is that the polls are not an accurate representation, she says, of the people who will come out, and she believes ultimately get her across the finish line. She says those are the people who are yeah. typically ignored by polls, people who don't necessarily get those phone calls, but she is making it her focus yeah. to go out and talk to those people and find those people. Something her campaign has told me is that really they're looking at the places where the early voting turnout lagged, and that's where they're being very intentional about sending her. But another thing that really is kind of a factor in all of this race, uh, Chuck, two things really, a couple of clouds that are kind of hanging over Georgia. Right. One, the new voting law, SB202, something that we've always talked about. And then, of course, the repeated doubts that have been cast on Georgia's election validity, something that election uh, workers are still trying to overcome here, Chuck. I'm curious here. We heard already in Florida, Val Deming's campaign in particular, um, making it clear, hey, the National Party sort of abandoned us. There's no doubt the National Party has been all in on Raphael Warnock. Does Stacey Abrams believe she's gotten enough support from National Democrats from the DGA or not? She certainly hasn't complained about it. I do think one thing that is certainly notable is what she's talked to me and said this time around her candidacy is established. She says in 2018, she really kind of had to fight to show people that she was a legitimate candidate. She didn't have that issue this time around, and that showed in her support, that showed in the fundraising that yeah. she's been able to garner as well. Uh, and I think it's also shown in some of the big names that have come here to the state to support her candidacy. Well, there's no doubt, I think, win or lose uh, the Stacey Abrams political machine is something that many a Democrat probably would like to have access to. Anyway, uh, Blaine Alexander in Georgia Forest. Blaine, thank you. Before that, Dasha, uh, Ali Vitali, and Jesse Kirsch.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.